Hey, and thanks for tuning in. Today we're going to do something a little bit different. Rather than talking about science, we're going to talk about how to actually do science. We're going to talk about how to gather information together and use that information to define a well thought out testable hypothesis. We'll talk about how to design an experiment and generate data and how to use that data in a way that we can present our results to other people. So sit back and relax because today I'm going to teach you how to science. So right now, you're probably thinking, hey Dave, how hard can it be to actually do science? It seems fairly simple, right? You develop a hypothesis, you design an experiment, you test it, boom, you got data, awesome, what your hypothesis is either right or it's wrong. Well, unfortunately, it's not that simple. And there's lots of things that we have to do in order to do science correctly. And that's the key here. We don't want to just do science, we want to do it correctly to generate reliable data, to rigorously test our hypothesis. But first, we've got to define a well thought out hypothesis. But that's not the first step. So a hypothesis, as we described in a previous video, if you haven't already seen that, you might want to go back and take a look at it. A hypothesis is a testable explanation for an event or uh, a phenomenon. But in order to define, develop a hypothesis, the first thing we actually have to do is make observations. Now making observations seems pretty simple, and in many cases it is. It could be as simple as going out in the field and observing some sort of phenomenon or an event. Maybe you're interested in a particular animal or an ecosystem, or maybe you're interested in some type of chemical reaction that you can do and study in the lab. Other times it could be a little bit more challenging. Perhaps later on in your career, if you're a graduate student or heading into graduate school or working on an honors thesis, you may actually have to go out and hit the stacks. You've got to go through scientific manuscripts. But the bottom line is this. Before you develop a hypothesis, the first thing we actually have to do and the first step in actually sciencing is to make observations. We need to learn everything that we possibly can about what it is that we're actually interested in studying. So whether that's reading, making field observations, or in many cases, if you're watching this video, you may be a high school student or a college student, you're just working in a lab scenario where you've been given a set of reagents to work with and you're gonna make your observations right in the lab. But the bottom line is this, before you can design a hypothesis, you have to know everything that you possibly can about the system or the phenomenon or the event that you're trying to study. All of that information goes into our inductive reasoning funnel. And if you remember, in the past, we have spoken about inductive reasoning. Inductive reasoning is that sort of uh, upside down triangle with the flat part at the top and the point at the bottom. Inductive reasoning requires us to take in as much information as we can, and then we synthesize that into a single general premise. And that single general premise is what we call a hypothesis. The more information we have, the better, the stronger our hypothesis or hypotheses can actually be. So once we know everything that we can possibly know or we can possibly learn about a given topic or an event or phenomenon, basically whatever it is you want to study, now we can get to step two. Step two is to actually generate a hypothesis. Now there's lots of definitions for a hypothesis. People often call it a, an educated guess. I don't prefer that particular definition. The main reason why is I don't like the idea that we're guessing. We shouldn't be guessing. If we're doing science right, if we've actually gone out, we've done our research, we've done our observations, we should be well beyond the point of guessing. We should be very well informed about what is likely happening in our system or that can explain that event or that particular phenomenon. So I prefer a hypothesis being defined as a testable explanation for an event or a phenomenon. Now notice in, in, in that statement, in that particular definition, nowhere does it say that we have to be right or that we have to be wrong. In fact, what we'll learn in a few minutes is that a good hypothesis doesn't depend on being right or wrong at all. But there are several characteristics of a good, strong hypothesis. The first thing is an absolute necessity. It's in the definition. A hypothesis must be testable. You have to have a way of actually examining results or performing an experiment that can test that hypothesis. 
but it also means that that hypothesis has to be both verifiable and falsifiable. There has to be a way that you can test your hypothesis that will decide whether or not your hypothesis is verified or right or falsified and wrong. Now here's the thing. It doesn't really matter. It doesn't matter whether you're right or you're wrong because in science being right or wrong gets you to the same endpoint eventually. Because remember, science is all about knowing. And the more we know about a system, the closer we get to the actual explanation for what is happening. Okay? So don't worry about being right or wrong. In fact, I would say that another characteristic of a good hypothesis is that it's bold. Wishy-washy hypotheses don't get us anywhere. You don't want to say, oh, if I change this, then something will change. I mean, is that a hypothesis? I mean, I guess. But is that a good one? I don't think so. Be bold. Science rewards the bold. If you have an opinion or a well-thought-out justified reason for why you think something should be done, then say it. I, you know, This is how this happens. Make a statement. So, for example, if we were curious to know which color of light is best for growing plants, we can make a wishy-washy statement as our hypothesis. We could say different colors of light will cause plants to grow differently. Is that a testable explanation? I mean, it is, but it's kind of weak, right? I mean, of course things are going to be different. No, be bold. Purple light will be the best type of light under which to grow plants. They'll grow the fastest or the strongest or however you want to put it. Note that I didn't say I think either. Of course you think that. It's your hypothesis. The other thing that I steer clear from, and again, it's not strictly right or wrong, if-then hypotheses. If purple is the best color of light to grow plants, plants will grow fastest under purple light. Again, not technically wrong, more of a personal preference. Speaking from someone that's done research in the past, who knows lots of people who still do research, we don't really sit down and say, if this, then that. No, we take our observations in and we say, based on all this, this is what I think is happening. And that's how we do our hypotheses, okay? Stay away from the if-then statements. But if you want to do it that way, if your instructor wants you to do it that way, then you probably should do it that way, okay? So now that we have our well-designed hypothesis, we're at the bottom of our inductive reasoning triangle, right? We've taken all the information we can in, step one. Step two, we developed our well-thought-out designed hypothesis. That's testable. It's verifiable. It's falsifiable. It's all good. It's specific. It's bold. It challenges the, the, the knowledge of the world. Great. Awesome. Now we have to get to our deductive reasoning triangle. And if you remember that, our deductive reasoning triangle is the one with the point at the top and the Y part at the bottom. This is where we start with that general premise, that hypothesis, okay? And then we make several predict predictions about what should be true if our hypothesis is correct, if our hypothesis is accurate or verified. And if we find out later on that those things aren't true, then we have to falsify our hypothesis. We'll talk about that in a minute. That's not the end of the world. Uh, that's just the way the cookie crumbles sometimes. So. In designing our experiment using deductive reasoning, the first thing we ought to do is decide what it is that we're going to test. So let's go back to our example of different colored lights in plant growth. Well, we've kind of already, by stating that hypothesis that way, that purple light is the best light under which to grow plants, we've kind of already done one thing. We've sort of outlined what our independent variables are. The independent variables are the things that you're going to test. The things that you are looking for an effect from. So in our hypothesis, we stated that purple light, or violet light, however you want to put it, is the best light under which to grow plants. Okay, great. So we know we're going to be testing violet light. But what else are we going to have to test? Well, we're probably going to have to test all different colors of light across the visible light spectrum, right? Purple light, blue light, green, yellow, orange, red, and all the way down. So in this particular example, those things would be our independent variables. Okay, those are the things that you're testing, your independent variables. That's one type of variable that we have in any good experiment. The second thing we need to have is a dependent variable. More often than not, your dependent variable is sort of your experimental output, what you're measuring. Now, 
look at our hypothesis again. First thing, violet light will be the best color of light under which to grow plants, right? Independent variables are our different colors of light. On the other hand, we have our very clearly defined dependent variable, the thing that's being affected, plant growth. Now you can be a little more specific. You should have a defined output. Are we going to measure plant height after how long? So on and so forth. What are we going to do? How are we going to do that? Right? But basically in short, our dependent variable in this particular example, the thing we're measuring is plant growth. However you want to define it. Okay. But there's a couple other variables that we really need to think about. So as I said before, in science, being right is great. Feels good, gives you answers, expands your knowledge. Being wrong is also good. I know it seems counterintuitive and it doesn't feel as good, right? It's sort of a feels bad man type thing, right? Um, because you did have a nice hypothesis. You had a reason for why you stated that hypothesis, but it turns out you're wrong. That's also fine. Because remember, the end goal is to learn more about the system. And, and if we get something wrong, if our hypothesis is not supported, that's fine. Because in doing that experiment and getting that, nope, my hypothesis wasn't accurate answer, we've learned more about the system. Does that mean we just throw our hands up in the air and go home? Absolutely not. What that means is we take the new information that we've gained from that experiment, use that to modify our hypothesis to reflect the new information we have we feed it back into that inductive reasoning funnel and then we form a new hypothesis that includes the new information the new data that we have okay but the answer you absolutely can't stomach in science is a maybe maybe is the death of a scientific experiment because it means you didn't account for something it means that you didn't get a clearly defined answer let me give you an example just based on this particular experimental example that I've given you. Let's say we set up our different pots with seeds in them and we've got, um, you know, purple light and blue light and yellow and orange and so on and so forth. And they're in different rooms and it's all dark except for that one lamp and yada, yada, yada. And we come back in two weeks to examine our results. And nothing is grown, nothing in none of the plants. None of the plants have grown at all. What can we glean from that particular experimental result? And the answer is that simple. Your first response might be, well, it turns out that you need all the different colors of light to grow plants. Can you say that? And the answer is no. Because what if there's something else in the experiment that went wrong? What if there was a, a short in the electrical system and the lights weren't on for half the time? What if there was something wrong with the soil? What if the seeds were too old? What if nobody remembered to come in and water the plants? They need water too, right? Well, a simple thing we can do to help eliminate that particular confusion would be to start including control variables. Here's a great control variable that would help answer that question. It's called a positive control variable. And it, a perfect example of that in this experiment is to have one condition that's just white light all the different colors of light in the visible spectrum. Now, if we come back two weeks from now, after setting up that experiment and nothing grew under the purple light, and nothing grew under the blue and the yellow and the green and the orange and so on and so forth. And also nothing grew in the room that had the white light in it. Can't we pretty accurately say that chances are something's wrong with the experiment. We need to set it up differently. We need to pay the guy who's supposed to come water them more money so that he'll show up or we need to make sure that nobody turns off the lights before they leave and go home because our plants aren't growing because they're not being exposed to enough light we need to adjust something else it helps eliminate that confusion but if that plant under the white light did grow and none of the other ones did well then maybe our first explanation is right maybe you do need all the different colors of light across the spectrum but what if the opposite happens what if you grow everything right under the various different colors of light and they all grow the same. You'd be tempted to say, Hey, it turns out it doesn't matter what color light you use to grow plants. They're going to grow at the same rate. They love them all the same, but you're probably going to be wrong there too, because you're missing one potential explanation. Something else happened. Maybe somehow white light was getting in on all of the plants at some point. Somebody kept leaving the door open or there's a, I don't know, a, a, a sunlight in, 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 in the rooms. There's, there's, a, there's, there's like a light at the top that can somehow get in and they're being exposed to white light where they shouldn't. How do we rule that out? Well, the answer is called a negative control variable. We include a condition under which plants are exposed to no light or 
shouldn't be exposed to light. We put no light bulb in that room. That's our negative control. A negative control variable is one where you know that you should absolutely get a negative result from. No growth in this consideration. Okay? Now, if we come back and all the plants grew like gangbusters, and that one plant that was in the room with no light bulb didn't grow at all, we can say, well, I guess. It turns out it doesn't matter what color of light that you use. Now, I should stress that neither of those results we talked about uh, here, where they all grow the same or they don't grow at all, none of those are, are true. Their plants do actually prefer certain colors of light and it's based on the absorbent spectrum of chlorophyll and we'll talk about that in a later video um, so this is just an example so now that we've designed our experiment we've put proper independent and dependent variables together we now have our proper controls that are helping us get either yes or no in terms of is our hypothesis supported or should it be rejected now that we have that well-designed experiment we're ready to run that experiment and when we run an experiment, quite often we have to do it more than once. Okay? When you do an experiment, you'd like to do it multiple times to make sure that all of your results end up agreeing with each other. Yep, every time I did the experiment, I did it three or four times, and every time it was the plant that was in the, the room with the, the, the purple light that grew the best. So I can say that, yep, my hypothesis is supported. Or nope, it turns out that they grew best under red light. My hypothesis was rejected. Okay? You want to do it multiple times. It's called reproducibility. And that's a key in science. We like our results to be reproducible. And not just by the first person that did the experiment, but other people as well. But how are other people going to know what your data is? Well, turns out what you need to do is report that data. Now, in, for many of you, the reports that you're going to be dealing with are those that are due at the end of every week uh, to your, your science teacher or your science your biology professor, or your chemistry professor, or whatever. And they're going to have a distinct format for that. But no matter how you present your data or to whom, what you need to do is present your data in a way that accurately depicts your findings. And quite often, that's going to take the form of either a chart or a graph or a table. But you can't just put data into any old table format or any old graph. It has to be one that accurately depicts your data and makes sense. So I'm going to show you a couple examples. And in the examples I'm going to show you is all of the exact same data. It's the same data from an experiment I did when I was a, a, a postdoctoral researcher. We were studying the lifespan of certain animals. So the first graph I'm going to show you is what we typically like to publish. You can see that in this graph, you've got on your y-axis um, the, the proportion of animals that are remaining, starting with one going down to zero, remaining alive, and on the x-axis, the number of days since they basically became adults. Okay, And you can see gradually over time, as you would expect, that population uh, dies off until it reaches there are no survivors. Does this accurately depict my data? Absolutely. It surely does. And you can see from that data, um, certain strains of animals live lived longer than others. Certain ones were slightly shorter lived uh, because their population died off sooner. Let me show you another example, another good way to represent this data. This is showing mean lifespan, sort of the average lifespan of each individual population of animals. It's a simple bar graph. Note that just like the first one, this graph is also easily interpretable. You can see what you're looking at, clearly labeled axes, okay? clearly labeled data, and it accurately depicts the mean lifespan, as in the average lifespans of the animals in that population. We do this for human beings too, right? You talk about what's the mean age, or what's the, what's the mean lifespan of uh, an American male or an American female, okay? Um, spoiler alert, it's right around 78 years, okay? Does that mean everybody lives to be 78? No, some people die younger, and some people die a lot older than 78, but on average, you're going to, on average, you live to be about 78 years old if you're a United States resident, okay? That's what we've done here with this sort of bar graph. These first two are perfectly acceptable ways of depicting the data. They're, they're accurate, um, they adequately represent the data, and they're easily interpretable. But how about this? Everybody loves a pie chart, right? Everybody loves a pie chart. They're simple, they're easy, they're colorful, and in this case, they are absolutely 100% useless. If I showed you this data, am I lying to you in any way? No. This is accurate data. It's the same data I just showed you on mean lifespan. But as a pie chart, a pie chart is basically the most useless way to represent this data at all. What does it even mean? Uh, that's a slightly bigger piece of pie than that? I don't, I don't understand. Is it wrong? No, it's real data. 
Is it useful? No, this is not a useful way to represent data. Okay. Let's look at a couple of examples of how we probably shouldn't show our data. Here's another bar graph. Take a look at this bar graph. Again, I will reiterate that this is the exact same data, a mean lifespan that you saw in the previous bar graph. But look what I've done. I've manipulated the y axis slightly to make it look like there's a much bigger difference between the mean lifespan of the three different strains. Now again, I will stress, am I lying to you? No, I've not manipulated the data in any way. But what I've done is I've adjusted the graph to make it look like there's a much bigger effect than there really actually is. In science, that's not really fair. It's not wrong in the context that you're not manipulating your data, but what you are doing is you're sort of manipulating the presentation of that data to sort of overstate what it means. Okay? So in science, we try to make sure that our our that we, we pass both tests. That when we present data, that we're doing so in a format that is both informative and accurately depicts our results. Now, for you, that's likely going to come in the form of your science teacher or your, your science professor that's grading your lab reports. And they may say, hey, you shouldn't use graphs like this. Or why did you give me a pie chart when this clearly was not how this data should be represented, right? And they'll let you know. But in the real world of science, how does that actually happen? Well, this is how this happens through a process, what is known as the peer review process. When you do research studies, when you do them, whether you do them commercially or whether you do them at a research institute like a, like a university or a college, what you need to do with that data is you need to publish it. You need to share it with the outside world. Remember, the whole point of science is to know. So as you generate your data, that data then contributes to what we call the, the, the published material surrounding that particular subject. Okay, it belongs to the scientific record. It belongs to the broader scientific community so that other researchers can sort of take your information and use that in their inductive reasoning to form better refined hypotheses to know more about that particular system, event, phenomenon, whatever. But how do we make sure only good data makes it into the scientific record? That's what the peer review process is designed to do. As you write manuscripts, manuscripts are written and they are submitted largely to scientific journals. And those scientific journals will send them out to two or three different editors who are experts in a particular field who will review that manuscript and they'll look for did somebody put in a pie chart when they clearly should have put in a bar graph or make sure that the experiments were all properly controlled that so make sure that everybody's interpreting their data their results in ways that are meaningful and make sense did they apply the appropriate control variables are they interpreting this maybe as a no and they'll sort of referee that to make sure that the data that does make it into the publication record is accurate data. It's the way that we ensure that the data that's out there is both verified and reproducible. Now, to be clear, this process is quite arduous. Honestly, that was the thing I dreaded most about research science was finally having to sit down and write the paper because you submit this thing. It goes out to two or three people that you may or may not know. They're always kept secret. You don't usually know who they are, right? And then they come back and here's, here's what always happens. This is the way it goes. You get one person who loves it. Great. Publish it. This is awesome. You get another person that loves it, but wants you to do a few things. And you've got another person that just hates it. They want you to go back and do a million experiments. And then it's up to the editor at that particular journal to ask you to do what you need to do to fix it. They'll say, we need to do this experiment, but don't worry about this, that, or the other thing. So then you fix everything you need to do, you update your manuscript, you submit it, and then it goes back to the same reviewers and they come back with all new issues. It's an arduous process. It's not a perfect process. But what I can say is right now, it's the best system we have to help make sure that only good quality scientific data makes it into the published record and can be used by other scientists in the broader community to help further our understanding of the world. I hope this video helped you understand how we actually do science. It's a little more complex than it seems on the surface, and there's a lot that goes into it. But when done right, scientific method is perhaps the best way of understanding our universe. But to be sure, it's challenging. It requires lots of effort. But if you follow these few simple rules that I laid out for you, you'll be incredibly successful in your scientific career. Thanks for tuning in, and I hope to see you guys next time.